We're so glad you've decided to join us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Our hope is that you're both encouraged and challenged in your relationship with Jesus. Be blessed as you listen to this week's message. Today, you guys are going to hear from a very good friend of mine and actually one of our church overseers, Josh Malonsal. Now, Josh is uh, hes a friend of mine who goes way back. He pastors a church called House of Prayer in Thibodeau, Louisiana. So uh, we've been knowing each other a very long time. His wife and I went to school together. So, man, but Josh is, a, is the kind of friend and he's the type of overseer of our church that whenever I have an issue and I'm asking for wisdom and trying to get, you know, some advice, he's always the guy who is like, man, have you prayed? Have you asked Jesus about this yet? Have you, have you been fasting about this? I'm going to fast with you, man. Let's just wait and see what God wants to say. And I'm always like, dude, you're so much more spiritual than me. I want to be like you in this area. So, man, he's just an incredible encouragement to us. And I just want you to know, and the reason I try to get our overseers to come and speak to you guys is I want you to know that, you know, we have accountability as a church. There are people above us. If I do something, I go off the rails and you guys have complaints and you don't want me to be a pastor anymore, you've got to go through them. And they can, they can remove me as pastor if that needed to happen. They are my spiritual oversight. They are the people I am responsible to as a, on a shepherding level. So I want you guys to hear from Josh today. And if you guys wouldn't mind, I want you guys to just you stand up on your feet. And let's give Josh a super warm welcome as Josh comes on up. Thank you, Josh. Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for letting me come today. Uh, it's such an honor. And uh, I am just kind of in awe right now. Um, you guys are supposed to be a church that's only uh, less than a year and a half old, but this place is rocking. Can you feel the presence of God in here? I, I, I'm serious. I'm excited. I'm super pumped. I knew uh, when Pastor Josh and Brooke decided that they would plan a church, I didn't wonder if they were going to be successful. I began to imagine just how successful they would be. And I am so proud of Pastor Josh and Brooke. And I think we ought to show them some love for being great leaders, phenomenal pastor. And y'all, Brooke, Brooke doesn't sing, she sings. You know the difference? That's the difference right there. Some people sing, and this worship team is phenomenal. I don't know everybody on the worship team, but they were on point. And I want to show some love for them as well. Phenomenal, guys. Um, I'm not going through a bunch of, uh, before I talk preliminaries, like, this is fresh and awesome for me because Keisha and I, uh, my beautiful bride over there, wave your hand, sweetheart. My sidekick, my ride or die. I don't know what that means, but the young people say that. And... Um, <laughs> It's probably like bad or something. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, but she's here. We are always in the trenches every Sunday morning. And uh, so we don't get to experience church as like a newcomer. And I'm just saying, when I walked in here, I felt such warmth and love, the presence of God, the worship team, they weren't practicing, they were worshiping, and they were such friendliness, and from the media, everything, everybody just had the spirit of excellence, and I just want to commend this church for loving people and loving God. Give yourselves a hand clap. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, I, I need to take care of something before I start talking today, and I do believe God has sent me here, and I'm so honored to be one of the overseers. Uh, what that means for me is that I try to cover you guys spiritually. I pray for you. I care about your families before I even know them, because God has put that love and that burden in my heart and give, given me a connection with Pastor Josh uh, that I think is divine, that God divinely appointed, and I'm so honored, but it, it, was, it really, really broke my heart. Uh, when I found out someone stole the trailer with all your equipment, it really grieved me. I'm like, that poor person has no idea what the future of their life's going to be, right? Like, you don't steal from the house of God. I guess we'll have to pray for them. Um, but uh, if you hear about somebody driving a trailer down the road, lightning strike, you'll know who it is, you know. Got them, caught them. But uh, <laughs> don't even have to do an interview. It's the one with the streak on the side of their head. <clears throat> but 
uh, House of Prayer was burdened for that. We're in the middle of a building fund, and I was just like, we're, we're doing a big parking lot right now that just cost us a bunch, a bunch of money. And I was, when he told me, I was like, God, this is the worst time for us financially for this to happen. But we had to do something, and this is not about us, because the Bible's kind of confusing here. It says, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is giving, you know, give in private. And then another part, it says, let your good works be known to all men. You're like, which one do I do? And I think it depends on your motive. And our motive for giving to you today is just about letting you know that we love you and we care about you and we really wish it could be more. But from House of Prayer, we have a $5,000 check that we want to give towards what God's doing here. So Pastor Josh, if you'll take that, love you, man. Appreciate you. Uh, I really do wish I could be more. I was like, I scrounged from everywhere I could because we just did a big uh, campaign. But I want to talk to you today from 1 Samuel 16 and... Uh, I'm kind of a wild communicator, like I don't know what I'm going to do, and I hope you're okay with that. I don't want to scare anybody. If you're new here, you don't have to put it with me next week. It's just today. But what I do is I pray a word up. I ask God, give me something that means something to these people. I don't know them, but you know them. I don't know what they need, but you know what they need. And God put this in my heart. So you can turn your phones, iPads, Bible. Does anybody still bring Bibles to church? Like we turn the lights off in our church. Like it'll do you no good to bring your Bible. But uh, whatever you turn to, go to 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. I'll read in the English Standard Version, the ESV. And I'll start from verse 6 and read through verse 13. Um, while you're looking for that, if you're wondering how I got such a beautiful wife is because I have an amazing personality. <laughs> I don't know. I've really had to deal emotionally how I feel about being the guy that's beautiful on the inside. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be that person, but uh, she is smoking hot. But anyway, First Samuel 16, verse 8. Uh, I can say that here, huh? This is a pretty contemporary church. Absolutely. You know, house prayers used to me. I just got to make sure. Uh, then Jesse, th let me set this up. Um, God has called Samuel to go anoint a king. This is a big deal. I know we don't pour oil all over people anymore. Um, if you do, that's okay, but don't pour any on me. But uh, this was a big deal. This was like symbolic. You're anointed as king, and Samuel doesn't know who he's going to choose. God just told him where to go. And so the prophet is there, and we'll pick up there in, in verse 6. It says, they came, meaning Jesse brought all of his sons that he felt could be king. And he brought it before the prophet who was going to anoint the king. And they came, and he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height of his stature. Now, I'm a short guy, so this means so much to me. And I, I, this speaks to my heart. But um, he, he's saying, don't look at his stature, how tall he is, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Mm. Then Jesse called Abinadab. And made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. Everybody says he stinks. stinks. <laughs> Say it again. Say he stinks. That's what happens when you keep sheep, okay? And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him. And now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. What I want to pick out there is how God selected his chosen one. And I just feel like you, you're, we are so privileged when God calls us into contact with him. But the way God picks his people are not the way we pick our people. Like, come on, guys. How many of you are single out there? How many single guys do we have? Raise your hand. Liars. Raise them high. Come on. 
Girls, where are you at? Where's the single girls? Y'all look around. Come on. ChristianMingle.com right here. You're welcome. Put a little something extra in the offering. That was special. $12 a month right there. I saved you. <laughs> when we pick somebody, we're like, is he tall? Is he dark? <laughs> and don't, don't lie, girls. Does he have money? And, and when we're picking the girls, we say things like, how well does she pray? <laughs> nah, no, you know you don't. You know you don't. You're like, you, anyway, I ain't going to say. I'm just P PG all day long. But we, don't, we look in a different way than God looks. Because when God's doing his work, he goes to the inside of a person. And that's how he picks them. When he decides they're going to do something special for him and they're going to be special to him, he looks at the heart, not the outside. I heard a quote that is really messing with me. I read it on um, God's favorite social media, which is Facebook. Um, if you believe that, you believe anything. But it said, it is so important that we have more in the warehouse than we do in the, sh in the showroom. I think it's so important that we have more going on with our private relationships with God than what we display on a Sunday. And so if we could, if we could just stand to our feet one more time, and I want to get going and, and, and pray and ask God. I, I want to preach on this simple subject, no longer nobodies. It's probably not good English, but I'm from Thibodeau. I get a free pass. But no longer nobodies. Some of you are here today and you have a special call of God. And even if this is the first time you've ever come in a church, God could be reaching for you. And you're like, me? Just like David. He had no idea he was about to be anointed king. I mean, he had probably just uh, taken care of a, of a sheep uh, or, or something along those lines. He had no idea God was transitioning his life into royalty. And God's calling some of you today. And you're going from obscurity to spiritual notoriety where God is calling you out and it's going to have a special touch on you today. And if you let God, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, I pray for strength today. I pray that you open up the hearts of your people to hear your voice. And God, if there's somebody in this room who doesn't know you, that today would be the day where they realize you called them out. That they didn't just show up today. They didn't just accidentally check out a church. But you drew them here because nobody can come to you unless you draw them. And Lord, that there be a special encounter of God today. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you look at your neighbor and say, you probably stink, but you're anointed. You may be seated. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm not talking to you. I don't even know you. <laughs> Get used to this because this is just getting started, okay? I know that God calls people and he calls them for specific reasons. But one of the things before God calls somebody is we have to deal with some things. He has to deal with us. And if you look at verse 1 in uh, 1 Samuel 16, we see a dilemma here where there's a previous leader who is leading in a bad way. And God's calling a new leader. But Samuel is grieving the process. He's not liking that Saul didn't work out because one of the greatest struggles you're going to have in your life in going forward into your destiny is dealing with your past. Anybody have a past? <laughs> Everybody alligator, alligator army. I get it. You don't want to go above the shoulder when you're confessing. I get it. But all of us have a past, even if you were raised in church. How many church brats like me, you were raised in church? Okay. Half of you, less than half of you. Uh, when you're a church brat, uh, you even need a higher level of salvation. Because you did all your stuff when you were supposed to be saved. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, where's my church brats at? Yeah, that's them. You can point at them. Beware of them. They needed a higher level of salvation. But no matter what, that past is the hard thing to get over. And a lot of times what will happen is when God calls us into something scary, the first thing we do is we look back at our past. And we're, we're, we're doubting what God wants to do now because of what we did back then. 
and we're like, God, you want to use me at Anchor Chapel? You want to call me into your grace, knowing what I did back there, knowing who I was? And the answer is yes, because the blood of Jesus Christ can erase anything that happened in your past, present, or future. God is greater than anything you can do. And that's, a, that's an important part in your walk with God. Uh, uh, they have a, a new show. I haven't seen it. Uh, so again, if I'm talking about something bad, I, it's innocent. But there's a show called Nobodies. And I'm like, it appealed to me before I've even seen it. It's a show about nobodies because it's like we're all on this quest to do something significant and to be special. There's something inside of all of us that God put us, that we have a purpose, but we don't find it until we come to Jesus. And something happens there because what we do, what most of us do is we spend a lot of time being somebody we're not. Wearing clothes to please people who don't even like us. Taking jobs to impress people who don't even care about us. And we do it. We get in these large car payments so that we're not embarrassed. You want to talk about embarrassing? Embarrassing was when I was dating my wife and I had a vehicle that pulled around snowball trucks. <laughs> That's right. I sold it as an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur. What I was was a snowball salesman, okay? But it's all how you word it. And that's who I was. She didn't marry me for sure because I was impressive. But I find so many times we're trying to impress people and we spend so much time trying to be somebody, but that is not the way it works. We're, we, we wind up becoming something that we aren't because we feel like we don't fit in. The reason you don't fit in is because you weren't made to stay there with those people. And if you feel like you're, you're, you're square and you're trying to fit in a round hole, it's because you were made differently. There's just some things we were not made to do. I remember when I was, um, when I was a younger father, my kids are 10 and 8 now and they're here today and already gave them the life or death threat and before they came in, don't you embarrass your mom and dad. You know, when you become a parent, you learn how to scream without raising your voice. Have you ever done that? You know, I, had to, I gave them that word. So they're over there, but when they were young, my wife decided that it would be best that she went to a ladies' conference. And I was home with the kids. Now, a good father just simply watches his kids. An inexperienced father like I was is babysitting. You understand the difference? It depends on your experience level and your skill set. My skill set was way down here. And she left, and I was like, babe, I got this. How hard can it be? It can be pretty hard. My kid, Miley was probably, uh, I mean, I don't even know how old she was. She was really small. She wasn't walking around yet. And um, I was feeding her, her food. Jensen was doing something that resembled eating. He was wearing most of his food, but he was eating. And then I heard this noise that dads never like to hear when mom is not around. I won't go into great detail of this noise, but it involved a noise that came from his back area, okay? And I looked over and he begins to cry. And what I realized was that Jensen had gone to the bathroom on himself, but it had been with such powerful anointing <laughs> that it shot up his back. And when I looked at his back, it looked like somebody had painted guacamole. I do not have a strong stomach when it comes to this kind of stuff. I didn't even want to change the diapers anyway. I was trying, is there like a three-day diaper or anything? I was already trying to get out of there. And now I've got guacamole fantastic all over his back. So I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh no, oh no. And Keisha's not there to put it on her because normally I would just say, here's your son. And I can't do that because she's not there. And so I grab him. I'm like, Miley's hungry. And I grab him. I'm like, oh my goodness. And you know, I'm you know, it's, it's coming. It's coming up. I know it is. We're about to have a bigger mess. And I take him and I, I put him in the bathroom and he's screaming. And then Miley starts screaming too because I haven't fed her in three seconds because I don't know if you have a little baby, but they like a bite right after the other bite. And, and she's screaming. I'm panicking. And I'm, I'm just getting nervous because I don't want to touch this stuff. And I certainly don't want to throw up all over the place. And I'm, I'm just struggling with it. So then I put him down on my wife's white rug in the bathroom. And then I realized what I did. And so I 
pick them up in a haste because I messed up her white rug, not realizing that I was putting my head when I picked him up into the guacamole. And I'm like, I am not supposed to be doing this. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. And, and I, I realized that there are some things I can't do and some things I can't. It's just who I am. It's the way I'm made. And that's what happens. Most of you are in a guacamole mess right now because you're trying to do something you're not made to do. And if you ever find that you're having a good time out in the world and you're partying, but you keep feeling empty and alone, it's because you were not made to do that. And look, there's a lot of Christian people who say, you know, it's not fun out there. Parting is no fun. They've never partied. <laughs> Partying is fun. They just, like Craig Rochelle always says, they didn't do it the right way. It is fun. But it leaves you empty and it leaves you void. Because you weren't made to indulge. You were made to invest in the kingdom of God. And so God is calling some of you into something that is bigger than you. And when you're called into that, you're gonna realize that you were made to be somebody. Would you give God a hand clap of thanksgiving right now? So don't get caught in the trap. So here's all of David's brothers. They're walking up. And, you know, I can only imagine what this looks like, you know. I'm, I'm part of the production crew, and I'm part of the worship, and I'm a preacher, and I'm a pastor, and all of that is awesome. That, that's, to me, that is fantastic. But none of that is what God looks at. Because they're all showing what they're doing. And a lot of times we think we are qualified or unqualified by the external factors. But the external factors is not what decides whether you're called. It is the internal factors that decide whether you're called. And they're all walking up there and they are strutting their stuff. You ever seen, how many of you ever been to a church where apparently it's a fashion show? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You can tell by the way people walk around just real gaudy, and they park their nice vehicles in the front. I'm not against nice vehicles or anything, but you can just tell that it's a competition. Like God is in the front seeing who's dressed the best, and I imagine this is how his brothers were. Just, you know, check out these biceps, and check out, you know, these calves, and all this stuff. Look how tall I am, and look how handsome I am, and God said, I rejected all of that, because they think they can get this by their own strength. Anytime you try to get someplace in God by your own strength, it will be rejected. What God recepts, receives is a humble heart that says, God, I know I'm not good enough, but you were good enough for me. Here is my heart. I give it to you. And when God takes that heart and it's offered to him as a pleasing sacrifice, he says, you're the one. And I can imagine when God called David, that everybody around there said, this guy? And I wonder if God's calling someone out today to be somebody for him. And you're saying, this girl? This guy? Does he know who I was? Does he know what I've done? Does he know what I don't have? And God's saying, I don't pick you by all that external stuff. I pick you by your heart. I look deeper than what everybody else can see. And I'm going to tell you, all you single people, before you get married, I'm not saying you don't need to be attracted to the one you love, okay? But what I'm saying is you better find out who they are internally before you say, I do. Because if you say, I do, before you find out what's in their heart, you're going to say, I wish I didn't. Because you've got to know what's in the heart because that is what matters. And the church said, amen. Amen. So David's out there. Now, he's got a stinky job. Uh, I don't know. When I walked up here, I was like, man, they have a whole church serving here. It's like almost the size of a church, just the serve team. And I was so impressed. I walked in. Everybody was friendly and kind. And it was so cool. But I was thinking, those are the people that are in the field watching sheep. Because there's no glory in waking up really early on a Sunday morning, coming here and serving Anchor Chapel. 
but they did it because they love you. They did it because they care about you. And I just want to say, I am super impressed with all the Davids that are in the field working for the kingdom of God. I think we ought to owe them a hand clap, the whole serve team, everybody who served. <coughs> but he's in the field and he stinks because when you get in God's work, it's kind of smelly. You're going you're gonna to run into some stuff. Um, I, know, I know that people think that the church should be a non-human place where everyone is robots and perfect. But even in the church, people are flawed. Slap your neighbor and say, you're flawed, buddy. Slap your other neighbor and ask him not to press charges because you don't even know them. <laughs> you're flawed. <clears throat> you're flawed. You have, and, and David was flawed. He stunk. But this was so cool because when he comes in, not even his own father had chosen him as a potential candidate to be king. And we learned something else in this, that some of you, even though your parents didn't see in you what God saw in you, doesn't mean you're not special in God's eyes. Because I can tell you, some of you are parented well. I have great parents. But I know a lot of my friends and a lot of the people that work at House of Prayer, they don't have good parents that invested in them, that believed in them, and that loved them. And so they begin to identify with the neglect and the rejection, and they think their Father in Heaven rejects them because their parents reject them. But don't forget, Jesse rejected David as a potential king, but God called and anointed David. I wonder how many of you were rejected by your parents, but have received the anointing and the blessing of God. Because your parents don't get to decide that for you. And he walks in, and then he does this thing where he anoints them. He pours oil on them. Now, in the New Testament, it still talks about it, but it wasn't as prominent. And uh, it just meant something, uh, it had evolved into some things. But I've read, read up on some of this anointing stuff. Because we talk, you know, in the traditional church, you talk a lot about, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. You know, it means empowered, favored, and blessed of God. And, but they say that what it originated from was that <clears throat> the sheep used to get bugs and ticks and stuff around their ears, and it would kill them. It would suck the life out of them. So what they would do is they would anoint the, the heads of the sheep to keep the bugs out away from them, and it would preserve and protect and empower the sheep. So it became one of those things where you were anointed, you were blessed and favored and protected of God. Have you ever wondered why all the bad things that should have happened to you didn't happen? It's because you're anointed of God. And the stuff that does happen can only benefit you and become a stepping stone into the next level. But you've got to decide that the anointing of God is more important to you than the opinions of man. And I, that is where it's all at, is when God anoints you and God appoints you, you have destiny. And there's somebody's heart here today, and God sent me here to talk to you, where you feel insignificant, but it's like something is in you, and you can't explain it, that there's something more for you, that God's calling you into something a little deeper. And you've done all the things I talked about. You've looked at your past. You've looked at your pedigree. You know, my parents this, my parents that, my mistakes, my failures, my shortcomings. But there's still something burning in you that says, I need something. I need more. I need purpose. And God's calling you today. And he's saying, no longer are you going to be a nobody. Today I'm going to call you somebody because the Bible says that he calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God is reaching for someone today. And he's saying, come a little deeper. Open up your heart to me. And I will anoint you. I will give you the power to be what I have destined for you. But until you come to me and let me anoint you, let me bless you, you're not going to be the king that I've called you to be. David was anointed king. Imagine the feeling, thinking he was the least of his brothers, obviously, or they would have brought him in. He was the least of his brothers. He's just a shepherd. He stinks. They got him doing all the grunt work. And God says, you're the one. 
You're the one I'm calling. And I just feel like somebody here today, God is calling you. God is saying, come out. Today's your day that you turn your heart over to God. And I don't care how you respond today. I'm not going to make a big issue about how you respond. What's important is that your heart responds. That you say, God, I want to be the one you call today. Would you stand to your feet? <coughs> I pastor, I don't know what you call a large church. We're approaching that thousand number. It's a small town, but we just, God has blessed us tremendously. Uh, I didn't grow up doing ministry. Um, I played the drums in our church till I was 21. I always tell people the reason why they let me play the drums is because they could put me in a cage. Um, I t horrified of public speaking, horrified. In college, I took speech class like towards my senior year because I was so afraid to speak in front of people. Nothing about me said I was supposed to be a pastor and a communicator. I didn't know who I was. I had no idea. I grew up in behind a church in a trailer that used to be Sunday school rooms. Y'all familiar with that term? And it was Sunday school rooms. And now I had to live there because my parents were given their life to do a work for God. And I wanted nothing to do with ministry. Nothing. I didn't want any part of it. Nothing about it appealed to me. My favorite line was when I'm 18, I'm out of here. It never happened. When I was a senior in college, God began to deal with me. And it began to make sense of everything that I thought was wrong with me and everything I was afraid of, he started building. Long story short, I gave my heart truly to God out of my own desires and started pursuing helping people. I didn't start out wanting to preach or pastor or any of that. I would start to preach in coffee shops like Bible studies and stuff and people would make fun of me that would come in the coffee shops and my parents living room and, and I was trying to do everything I could to do something for God. I didn't know who I was but God called me out and I just feel like God's calling somebody here today to come to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just feel like Somebody needs to make a strong commitment to God. And you say, I don't know how. You don't have to know how. You just have to be willing. David didn't know how to be king. He just knew God was calling him. And I feel like God's calling some of you here today. And he's grabbing for that heart. And he wants to know if you're in. If you're in, he's in. He'll help you do what you can't do on your own. The question is, will you respond? Because today is your day. Today is the day of your salvation. If you feel like this message was for you, and God is speaking to your heart, whether you're coming to God for the first time, whether you just feel like God's calling you deeper and you need to respond, would you just lift your right hand? Nobody looking around, every eye closed. Would you just raise your right hand? I want to pray for you real quick. You can put it down. Father, in the name of Jesus, every hand that was raised, you saw it. You see, the, you see the dealing of their heart, God. We all have sin. We all fall short. We all need help, God. But if you would forgive us of our sins and let us see our calling today and be filled with your power, be filled with your strength, be filled with your love today. Lord, let somebody walk out of here anointed for destiny, appointed for destiny, called into something bigger than themselves. A heart completely yielded, even though there's struggles in their life. God, bless Anchor Chapel. Bless the pastor. Bless the leadership. Bless this place. Give them bigger, larger meeting places, God. Expand their territories, for you have called them out. And you have said, I want you to do a work in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Would you give God a hand clap of praise and worship? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel. If you're interested in supporting the ministry of Anchor, you can easily do so by visiting our website, anchorchapel.com. You can also follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. God bless, and we'll see you next week.